Hello, I'm Dominic Davis, founder of Pink Therapy. We've been training mental health specialists worldwide to work with gender, sex, and relationship diverse clients for many years. This podcast puts the lives of some of these incredible pioneering therapists front and center and gives us insights into what it's like to be LGBTIQA+, or as we prefer, GSRD, speaking in their words. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to On Becoming a GSRD Therapist. This is our first podcast of 2023. I'm Dominic Davis, and I'm joined by Dr. Alejandro Gep. Gep or Jep? Yes. Gep, I will say. Who is a child and adolescent psychiatrist in Chile and just about to finish our um, advanced specialist diploma the two-year program in GSRD therapy. Welcome. How are you today? Thanks, Dominic. Thanks for having me. Pretty good. Nice day here in Valparaíso. We have sun, the middle of summer, so I'm pretty good. Oh, summer sounds great. I, I'm missing summer. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your work. How do you spend your time? Okay. So... My name is Alejandro Gebb, like you said. I go by the pronouns he, him, his in English. I use el or suyo in Spanish, which are our typical masculine pronouns. And in any, any other language, I'll go with whatever you usually use for men and masculine people. But I actually won't care if you use any set of pronouns. I also want to say I never learned formally English, uh, so my accent and pronunciation are like a mix of everything I've been taking in uh, from different places. Uh, so uh, let me apologize in advance if this is hard to understand, but be patient with me. <laughs> and uh, about me, well, I, I, like I said, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, I was born, studied, and I'm currently working in Valparaiso, Chile. So I'm from around. Um, um, and I wanted to tell a little bit about Chile and Valparaiso, uh, for those who don't know. Uh, Chile is in the Pacific coast of South America. Uh, we are a, a thin and long country. Uh, we were colonized by the Spanish in the 16th century. Uh, and we are known for exporting copper, wine, and poets. Very good wine. Yes. In my good opinion. wine. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and Valparaiso, is a, it was a port city. Uh, it's at the north of Santiago, our capital. Uh, and it was a big part until Panama Canal was made. Uh, every every ship that was going to uh, was going to the west coast in the United States uh, had to make a stop in Valparaiso. But once the Panama Canal was made, we were no longer like a big port. And now it's more of a tourist destination and a college town. We have a lot of universities here, so uh, it's uh, pretty popular to come to study. And I think that's important because we have this phenomenon of GSRD migration, where people go to bigger cities. I think we have discussed this before, that this also happens in a lot of places, right? So they're leaving Valparaiso to go to Santiago or to other, to other countries? No, from, from smaller towns, and they usually come to into Valparaiso, Santiago, and Concepcion, I would say, that is the other big city in Chile. Most people come to this one of these three big cities to study. And they also come like for the liberty of expressing GSRD identities because this is kind of safer and with a bigger community than most of the other small towns around Chile. So that's about myself and the place I work and live. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the kind of work that you're doing with children and adolescents in terms of what's your DSRD contact in that, in that work, in that field? Mm? Well, I, I mostly work with child and adolescents. I work at the bigger hospital in my region, and we have the, a gender identity program. So I work with children and adolescents there and their families, of course. I'm just one of the two psychiatrists we have in the whole hospital, so I have to do a lot of different things. That means I do emergency care, I do consultation psychiatry, I do inpatient, outpatient, 
So I try to dedicate as much time I have to the gender identity program because that that's like my main focus of interest at the moment. But I'm I'm a jack of all trades, like you were saying. <laughs> I, I do a lot of, of different things because of necessity. But yeah, I, I, I will say my, my biggest work around GSRD identities is working with trans and non-binary or gender non-conforming children and adolescents and their families. And I also have my, my private practice where I work with some adults, some other clients uh, with GSRD identities besides gender, gender diversity. I also teach at my local university, Universidad de Valparaíso. I do the developmental psychology course for the child and adolescent psychiatrist students. And I also also do consultation psychiatry and emergency care for for them. I teach that. You sound very busy. I would say that that consumes most of my time. Yeah. Do you have Do you have any spare time after that? Um, I was wondering what life is like in um, in Valparaiso for other GSRD folk. How is the queer community there? You said people travel from and move in there from the villages, mm -hmm. but what kind of infrastructure is there? I would say uh, living in, in Valparaiso is safer than the average of average of Latin America, which is probably lower than the average of Europe but it's still it's safer than the rest of Latin America. We obviously have the same problems like everywhere else that we have occasionally hate crimes and the disparities among the hate crimes are usually that trans and non-binary folks get the worst part. I would say 10 lesbians, 10 gay and bisexual people. But uh, we have some legal support. We have an anti-discrimination anti law we have equal marriage and also a gender identity law that allows people to change their name and gender markers. So we, I, I think that the legal support is, is rather good, but we are still polishing their implementation. Like, for example, I, I, I work with adolescents and they can change their gender markers and name from 14 years old with consent of their parents, which is actually very good comparing to a lot of countries. but like some family judges will ask you for them to be on some kind of gender programs or they're not want ask for that. Some will ask for a psychiatrist or a psychologist letter to allow them. Some will ask them for one year living in the in their preferred gender identity that they are going to, to change the, the gender marker. Some will ask for two years, some will ask for one year. So we're still polishing the details about that. How can we make that work? But yeah, at least we got some legal support to recure. And we also have like NGOs working with the different parts of the community. We have NGOs working to diminish hate crimes, to support people living with HIV, to get more rights, to have access to affirming care. We have our GSRG bars, we have a local ballroom scene. We have our own drag queens. So we have like whatever you will find in any other particular big city, usually smaller. Like we don't have like a, we have like two kiki houses <laughs> here in Valparaiso. It's not like a, a big ballroom scene, but we, we you can see people boging around. They, they usually meet uh, like, uh, very near my my building, so I I usually see them like on it Friday like evenings. Look, it looks like you're looking out of the window to see if they're down there now. <laughs> yes, yes, it, it's just they they meet just where I take off of my bus to get to my house. So I I usually see them around some hour practicing there. Sounds pretty good. I imagine you have a, a fairly big pride parade and and all of that pride month type thing as well. I wouldn't say it's that big, but we do have a pride parade. It's getting bigger, I will say. A lot of people, I think, are feeling more, are feeling safer to express themselves here in Valparaiso. You can occasionally see people holding hands and 
I recently started noticing that some people are hanging rainbow flags in their houses or apartments, which it, it was something that uh, it really called my attention, attention and my boyfriend's attention when we traveled outside Chile, that a lot of people had that and, and we didn't haven't seen that in Valparaiso and, and now we are starting to see people like proudly showcasing their beautiful flags. So I think I, I think things are getting actually better. Are good but I are getting better. That sounds great. It's it's great to hear the the increased visibility um, and see that happening on the street because it kind of gives courage to people who are feeling uh, more perhaps more ambivalent or uncertain. I'm wondering about the challenges facing the communities that you're working with. What what would you say are some of the challenges? I would say that we have like the same basic challenges that we have already discussed in other moments in our in the program, like safety, housing, how homelessness, having mental health tailored for GSRD folks. I, I I say that we we probably are advancing in that front, but I think a lot of them, especially like safety and housing, are still not tailored specifically for GSRD folks. Like you find someone that is getting partner violence and you have to send them to a, a refugee. Uh, we still, most of the refugees are for men or for women and, and they uh, want, you have to ask about information if, if someone non-binary or trans can access them. But I, I think we we are getting better around that. But uh, I think those basic challenges that uh, the SRD community are facing like around the world are pretty much the same we are having here. I will say that uh, uh, another challenge is the availability of gender programs. Like like I said, and if people don't know, they should look for a picture of Chile. It's a very long country. Like it's not very wide, but it, it goes very long. It's, it's the longest country in the world, in fact. We have to have gender programs and specialist programs in general around the the whole, the whole country for people to have to be near to a gender clinic. And we are articulating a network that uh, we call the No Network because it's it, we we are legally not articulated, but uh, we share information. We look for ways of transferring clients between us when we when they travel to another part of the country and we are we want to become a real network and get uh, legal support and support from the authorities and and we are advancing in that but i will say the gender programs are specially developed in central cities like in the center of chile and they are not that well developed in the extremes of our country. So I will say that also makes a lot of GSRD migration. A lot of people come to Valparaiso because they know we have a, a gender program and they change. If they want to access to public health, they change their address to one in, in Valparaiso. You have to be in, a, in an address in Valparaiso to receive care from our gender identity program. So we have people that change their address to the to the building in front of the hospital. And we were checking the other day and, and there was like, I don't know, like thousands of people living, supposedly living in, in the uh, building in front of our hospital. But that's just because they put the address that they find near and they live elsewhere and, and they travel for the for getting the the gender affirming care. That's kind of funny, but it's, it's, it's also kind of sad that people have to migrate just to get affirming care. So I would say that uh, one of our, our biggest challenges is establish gender programs across the, the whole country. We didn't have like the political momentum to do that, but uh, we had a change of government recently and we are getting more support because of that. I think that our other challenge is how can we capitalize 
this government moment to get uh, secure our, our rights? Because we are seeing worldwide that there's, there's, we are getting this backlash from the far right, like what happened in, in Brazil. They got a lot of, I would say, progressive governments, and they, they got this Bolsonaro guy that tried to dismantle a lot of the advancements they had made. And we're in the moment that uh, we're trying to learn about what has happened in other countries. Um, what can we do to prevent that if this government doesn't get another period, we can keep our rights and our gender programs and our liberties. And if, if we get this, this backlash from the far right, we don't lose that much. I would say that that's our main challenges in this moment. I think that's I think that's a good strategy to to keep advancing as far as you possibly can, so that if if and when the government change, then those rights don't get rolled back and taken away. It's quite hard to take them away, but it's also quite hard to get them in the first place. So once they're there, yeah, it's like we can't remove yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, I I also think that it's it's maybe it's not that easy to take them away, but. I think we we are seeing what what is happening now in United States. Yes, right? exactly. Uh, uh, they're not having too much problem in removing them now. They they are banning some gender programs in some states, and and we really don't want that to happen. But I I will say that one of the things I I I love of being in pink therapy is that I can get closer to the reality of other countries, and and I will say that it's kind of of uh, having a crystal ball to look into the future of what's going to happen. Like, for example, when when we first discussed discuss chemsex, I remember on the first year of, of the program, I said like, well, that, that doesn't happen a lot in Chile. Uh, I haven't seen really much about that. And now we are seeing uh, chemsex. So it was like, uh, it, it's great because I, I was already prepared to face this, this particular challenge. So we are now seeing that when, when all these this thing about the Tavistop, the Tavistop Clinic gender program happened in the UK. I remember we, we also started some discussions about how can we assure that our adolescents can give consent to what they are undergoing. And we started working in, in better informed consent forms and share them between the different programs. And now we are getting like some there's voices and far right voices like asking in social networks and in politics debate like well how how can we how can we assure that adolescents can give consent to this particular intervention uh, so it's like uh, uh, we can get ahead by looking at other countries and i think like the the other big thing that we are looking ahead is like this backlash about trying to take away our rights and we can be prepared uh, if we look to the other countries, I, I think that's a very good opportunity. I'm, I'm really pleased that your participation in the program has kind of given you a, a heads up on what might be happening down there in in time to come, and so that you get informed and can prepare for it. And that's um, that's very interesting to hear. I hadn't um, I hadn't really kind of pictured that. I've been conscious of that. You sound very passionate about your work. Yes. I, I I pretend to keep working on gender care as, as long as I can, uh, at least. So what motivated you to undertake our program and how did you hear about it in the first place? I'm not, not really sure uh, about how I hear about the program in the first place. I remember I was, I had started working in, in, in my hospital in what was going to develop as the gender program for children and adolescents. And I noticed that I wasn't really prepared to do that. So I encountered clinical situations and I had to look for books or resources on the topics. And I had to uh, enroll myself to seminars and, and look for courses and things like that. And I started looking for, for courses in Chile, but I, they usually tend to focus on sexuality more than gender diversity. So I, I couldn't find, find something that fit all my needs and in the length 
that I, I also wanted because I, I used to find some teachings about gender, but they were like a week long or, or something like that. So I, I wanted something more robust for say. And I remember I went to the WPAT Congress when they were in Argentina. And I remember they had an, an app that you could use to navigate the Congress. And they had a list of people that was signed. And they could put like their organization. So I I did a little of Sherlock Holmes around that. And I started to look for the organizations that I, I saw in the, in the list. Uh, that people were on road. And I think I, I got to pink therapy in that way. Like I saw some people that were, that put pink therapy in their profile. And, and then I found the course. And I wasn't really sure about taking the program because it was in English. And I, like I said, I, I don't have like a, a formal knowledge of English. I, I, just learn through video games and reading and movies and things like that. And I remember I, I asked you in the first interview, like, uh, will this level of English be enough? And you told me something like, uh, because I, I also went like two months to Georgetown during me, my my training as child and adolescent psychiatrist. And you told me something like, oh, well, if you understand those barbarians that are talking English, like in, in a particular way, in America, you, you can understand um, British English. That is the proper way to speaking, <laughs> or something like that. And, and I became more comfortable, and I took the course. I think that that's also linked to the things that I'm passionate about. I'm, I'm very passionate, I would say, about learning. I, if I go to a particular place, I, I try to read books about the place, and I especially try to read or, or look for things that about how the GSRD community lived there. Like, I I, I went to, for example, I, I went to uh, South Korea recently, and I was reading a little bit about how was being GSRD <laughs> during the Joseon period, uh, like in, in the history, how this, it changed with colonization. And I was uh, like like wondering how, and how, how can this be like in North Korea? Uh, like, I, I always have this, I, I think it's part of, of what I took from the program that I, I become more aware of how important culture is for how we express our I identity. So I, I always try to learn a little bit about that. And I also like, I'm also passionate about sharing what I learned and um, I'm looking for a way to share what I learned in pink therapy. I still, I'm still not quite sure how I, I will do it. I like, for example, I, I participated in some courses with other GSRD alumni like Valentina. We have, we have done some courses together and I try to accept as much invitations to Congress and seminars and things like that to, to teach also from I'm capable of, but I don't know. I'm, I'm still exploring the ideas of doing a course myself or writing or um, getting in touch with other teams to do research. I'm, I'm still deciding on how to teach. I, I think it's important to share the knowledge that I have the privilege to, to have. I, I know a, lo a lot of people are actually enthusiastic about learning uh, the things that, that we we learn at pink therapy, um, and I always send them the 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 the, the web page and and now the social media resources. But I I think it's still we have this barrier about language, and also an economic barrier. Uh, I will say that there's like a a recession going on in Chile, so so people are being very cautious to spend their money. So. I would like also a way like to share the knowledge that you guys generate at Pink Therapy. What was the most interesting part of the of the whole two year program for you? Oof, I, I think I, I will have to select more than one. I really like the intersectionality uh, module. I think that that was the part where I noticed how big culture and different identities could 
coming in handy to understand how people express their identities and why are these things different in different parts of the of the world and in different cultures how culture and other identities can shape the way we express our DSRD identities a phenomenon that happen everywhere uh, i think diversity is, is something natural to human nature but we put different names and conceptualize things a conduct or an identity as something to be proud of uh, or something to be ashamed of. And that had to do a lot about culture and our other identities. So I think that was uh, very interesting for me. I didn't have a course uh, about intersectionality before. And it has become very handy since we are receiving migration now from other parts of South America to Chile because there are other countries that are, are going to economic or social issues and we are getting different cultures in Chile. Chile is getting more multicultural now. And I, I think understanding that through an intersectional lens uh, has become very important to me. I will also say that the, the modules about um, gender identity and mental health were very helpful to me. I think I, I said during the foundation course that I was feeling very lonely doing my practice here in Chile because I I was reading a lot and trying to learn a lot, but I wasn't like quite sure if I what I was doing was the thing I, I should be doing because I didn't uh, had anyone to ask to. And when I started like meeting with with I remember in, in the intensive I asked Antonio about things about his practice, uh, Antonio Brunas. And I said, hey, uh, this is not that different of, of, of what I, I'm doing. So I, I, I would say that that was like a big relief moment. And I, I think I, it's one of the, the, the moments I, I appreciate most of the course. And of course, I, I, I will also have to say like the CDGs or technical discussion groups, part of, the, of, of what I like about doing therapy is the, this community we have built being uh, from all over the world, very diverse, and it, I, I, I usually leave the CDGs uh, when we, when I discuss my cases with solutions that I haven't think of, and that other partners from their different identities and from the different places and their different experiences share with me, and I think that that's very valuable. And I always uh, end the CDGs with like, wow, this, this was so helpful to me so i think that 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 were like my uh, most interesting parts yes i think those that clinical thread uh, and having an emphasis on practice and increasing one's knowledge through learning about clients through each other and, and sharing different modalities and ways of thinking about stuff is is really very very important and doesn't doesn't tend to occur on other courses they they may do the kind of didactic stuff about a subject but not really looking clinically at, at developing those that knowledge so i'm glad you find that yeah. that helpful yeah I, I think it it's also funny like uh we we have discussed this with uh other participants in, in the cdgs that we all get like some degree of imposter syndrome when we are hearing each other like we are all like damn my 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 partner knows so much about this and and it's so intelligent and he comes up with they come up with with so many different answers to these problems and and we, and we say like wait do you feel that too like everyone was being like getting a lot of of their share in 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 the cdg so I think that that reflects how great a moment, how helpful it is. And how how has the course changed your practice? Do you think, Alejandro? I'm much more confident now. I'm I'm working like with way more confidence. I I, I used to encounter a lot of different situations that I didn't know, knew how to what to do. So I had to ask for a lot of help or 
buy a particular book or search for a particular paper. I think a, a lot of what is written is theory and not so much clinical knowledge. So it was sometimes difficult. And I used to wonder what, how, how can they... Uh, I know that people... I'm not the first one encountering this issue. So there must be something out there where I can get these answers. And I think pink therapy was like this place where I found like a lot of answers and a lot of questions also about how to work. And I think that that uh, how I became more confident. Like now I rarely encounter situations where I, I don't know what to do. So I'm way more relaxed and confident at working. And I, I think that you can, clients, especially children and adolescents, can feel it if you are relaxed and, and you I know that I have like the all the explanation and, uh, and, and most of the answers that parents are looking for in my brain and we have already discussed them in some part of the of the program I I always had this feeling that there was going to be a, like a curveball do you do you you guys don't don't play baseball in, in, in... Uh, no but I understand the concept of a curveball yeah yeah it, it's, is there a curveball like in cricket or something like that? Or Yeah, I think there is in cricket. I think there probably is, although I don't play cricket anymore, but yes. Okay, let, let's say a, a cricket curveball uh, for our England people. So I, I, I always had, had that sense that uh, there was going to happen something that I, I wouldn't know how to answer, and, and it, that's not happening anymore. I, I think I have learned most of what I need for my practice, for the basis of my practice, I will, but I, I, I keep getting more and more information. Like I, I will, for example, I'm, I'm now reading this transex by Lucy Fielding, which is very good. And I'm still surprised how, how much knowledge is out there, but I know where to look for it. And I know who to ask to, and, and I'm way more confident now in my practice. Uh, I will say. And I, I'm way more affirmative also. I, I will say that I know more about diversity and how diversity is positive and not something to be fearful of. And I think that I, I can also transmit that to my colleagues. colleagues. I work with a lot of pediatricians, endocrinologists, urologists, gynecologists, etc., um, neurologists also. And I think I'm, I'm way more confident to explain them uh, about affirmative approaches and how diversity is something to be proud of instead of, of something to look at a pathology or something to correct. That's, that's a really good reframe. Absolutely. Yeah, to celebrate it rather than to be afraid of it. Yeah, even, even in things like for example, I, I, I work with a lot of people in, in the autism spectrum, and I think people here are aware of diversity in terms of gender, sexuality, but they are not very aware in terms of autism as neurodiversity or neurodivergence. It's still, I, I, I will say, most neurologists I work with are usually seeing autism as something to be corrected. And I think widening the focus of what diversity is has also been great for my practice good so um help uh, recommend me a, a book or a film that um because i'm always up for learning more from my students and so is that the one that you're going to give me lucy's book no no i, I think I, I heard of this in in during pink therapy so um and i haven't finished it yet I, I, I've been hearing the podcast, so I know most people have been recommending books or movies in English. And I, I wanted to recommend something that, as I work with children and adolescents, something that I, I will say that is more like in that focus. I, I will recommend this graphic novel. It's called My Brother's Husband, and it's by a Japanese author that is called Gengoro Tagane. It won like a, a, some big prizes, like the Eisner, that is like the winning like the 
literature novel, but for comic books. This is a Japanese author. He's gay. He used to write and draw a more like erotic literature. He works in, in this particular um, style that is called bara, that is something like uh, bears uh, for Japanese. But he's also now writing more uh, stories about being gay and, and what is being gay in different cultures, like in, in Japanese, uh, in Japan. And this is a, a very beautiful story. Uh, it's not erotic, so it, it, it's kind of safe for younger people. But you, of course, you can you can Google Gengoro Tagame and, and search for his more erotic uh, drawings and things like that. Uh, it's very interesting, also. But it's about like two two brothers. One goes to San Francisco. He's gay and starts a family there. And eventually, in an accident, he dies. And his husband had the promise that he will go back to Japan and and meet his family. So. The, the the husband's brother, the, the the husband goes back to Japan, meet the family of his of his husband that has died, um, and test like this cultural clash of of something that comes from a, a very open culture like uh, coming being a gay in San Francisco and this this family from Japan, where homosexuality is not something that that you really speak of, and it's very beautiful. Um, it sounds very beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really recommend that. I, I will recommend that book particularly. And I also wanted to recommend you something more academic from a Chilean author that is written in, in English. Uh, it's called Nobody, Clinical Constructions of Gender and Transsexuality. It's written by Miguel Rosselló Peñalosa, which is a, a psychologist I've known here in Chile. It talks about his experience uh, working in a hospital in Spain, uh, in Spain, and how uh, clinical discourses about gender and sexuality can shape how people feel about their bodies and how they understand their bodies. So I, I think uh, those are my two recommendations. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to trade you one for a movie that I watched just last night because I. I, I'm really excited by it. It was on Amazon Prime. Hey, tell me. Um, so I don't know if you have Prime there, but... Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you do? Okay, it's called it's Bros. It's not the same catalog, but... Or... Yeah. Oh, Bros. Yes. Have you seen it? Um, I haven't seen it, but I, I've i been following Billy Eigner uh, since he did uh, Billy on the Street. I used to find that hilarious. <laughs> and... So I, I I knew that he was doing this movie soon, but I I think it it, it didn't reach Chile. Uh, so I I will look if this uh, is licensed in Amazon Prime in, in Chile. Um, and otherwise I I will look it on on torrent. <laughs> I I have to pay for it, but um, Meg John Barker. I was having brunch with Meg John at the weekend, and they were mentioning it as being really good. And it was a book, uh, one of their books, or there was an Alex's, Alex Happy's book on, I think, Je Life is Not Binary or something like this, was featured at the beginning of the movie. And so they, they were talking about, really proud about how their book has made a Hollywood movie. Um, so I, I, I watched it last night and it's really sweet. I think it's, it's aimed especially at, at gay men, but it features all the other kind of members of the community. But it, it captures kind of gay male psychology and our ambivalence towards relationships and sex very well. Um, so, yeah, I can share that with you and our podcast listeners. So um, back to you. As a fairy, I'm a bona fide fairy. I'm proper. I've got all my licenses and everything. I'm going to grant you three wishes. What are you going to wish for? I, I, I always ask this question uh, because I, I, it's very useful with children. But let me, let me think. I, I will say I, I will ask first something for other people. Like I, I would like to, I will wish for safety for our community. I think one of the main uh, things I hear when I ask people 
especially kids, adolescent parents, everyone that fear usually for for from my experience comes from uh feelings of unsafety so i w- I will wish that every person could express their gender identity or their sexual orientation or the their relationship models safely without the fear of being being physically physically harmed or psychologically harmed like you could express as a children that you have you like someone in your school that is your same sex or that you are feeling like uh exploring the use of different pronouns or different clothes and and don't get aggression in as an answer uh, i think I, I will ask for that first nice um, that's a lovely one <laughs> Yes, for me, I will ask for be capable of reading faster and get my hands faster on new books. I I have a lot of books that I want to read. I have I usually make a big purchase of books uh, when we finish some module in pink therapy, and I I think I'm still reading the things I bought during the first year. So I I would love to be able to have more space to put some books, get books faster, read faster. I, I would love to to be able to learn faster and, and to share my knowledge with, with everyone else. What I, I, I've learned in Pink Therapy and what I'm learning, reading all these amazing resources that we are we are getting recommended by by the people that we are learning with. I think that, that will be my, my second wish. And uh, my third wish, I'm re- I really don't know. Does the fairies work like the the genie in Aladdin that I I can wish to set you free or something like that? <laughs> no, you can't. No, you I, can't I don't wish I don't for think... that, and you can't wish for uh, infinite wishes either. Somebody tried. Um, oh yeah. Oh, can yeah, I have? Maybe, a, can I, maybe have I, I will wish to to be asked uh, in a year more of of what uh, what I want because uh, that keeps on changing. Or maybe some superpower like something very uh, for me like teleporting to be able to travel to different places and and visit new cultures. I, I would love that. Teleporting would be an amazing one to have, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Just yeah. not to yeah. get jet lagged and just to drop pop in and out of places. I would. Uh, yes, I, I have spent a, a, ho- a lot on, on melatonin to for jet lag, so that will be really helpful. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for spending time talking to us today. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversation and connecting with you on this. And I look forward to um, to putting this up and, and letting other people hear the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Alejandro. Great. Thanks for the invite to me. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please click like and subscribe to hear when the next one is released. If you're a therapist looking to enhance your knowledge and skills with GSRD clients, please check out our training website, pinktherapy.org. We run one and two year specialist training programs online, as well as offer a wide range of short CPD modules. Thanks again for listening to On Becoming a GSRD Therapist.